today's webcast titled Message in a Molecule, which is a lead in for a broader discussion on the potential role of environmental DNA for biological diversity and invasive species inventorying, inventory and monitoring. My name is Rob Williams. I'm with TNC in New York, and I'll be facilitating today's webcast and discussion on the topic. I'd like to thank Megan Pistoli Shaw for technical assistance with today's broadcast. And due to the amount of participants that we hope will be on the call, I'd like to ask that participants mute your audio so as not to distract from the presenters. Also, with the exception of the presenters, we may turn off cameras to allow for better bandwidth during the call. The program is intended to be no more than an hour in length. However, we did reserve Zoom our Zoom license for a little bit longer, and that was just to cover for our prep time and potential overruns. During the program, we'll be hearing from myself providing a brief overview of TNC's Invasive Species Advisory Committee, Lindsay Chatterton, Aquatic Invasive Species Program Director with our Great Lakes Program, Lee Greenwood, Forest Health Program Director, and Nick Holmes, uh, Associate Director of our Oceans Program in California. Towards the end of the hour, we hope to have time for a brief discussion, and I would ask that you place uh, questions that you may have into the chat box. Time permitting, we'll extract those questions and have an open dialogue uh, session. So let's begin. Uh, for those of you who may not be acquainted with the Nature Conservancy's Invasive Species Advisory Committee, uh, we are, were established in 2012 under a charter sponsored through our North American Science Team. And we represent a community of practice whose aim is to help prevent and address threats posed by invasive species. We focus primarily on where invasive species threaten our shared conservation agenda goals of ensuring healthy oceans, freshwater, and lands in addressing climate change through mitigation and adaptation. Our current representation includes 15 representatives from 11 states coast to coast with one current vacancy. And we're hoping uh, we're currently seeking representation from the Southwestern region of the United States. Uh, ISAC members are listed here and you'll have the opportunity at the end of today's webcast to view our active members again before we depart. Some of the advisory committee's accomplishments uh, include biological control guidance. We revised an outdated and unscientific standard operating procedure and downscaled it to guidance rather than an SOP. We developed an executive summary on how the Nature Conservancy uh, uses herbicides on managed lands to meet conservation objectives in cases where herbicides provide the most effective method and only when and where appropriate. In 2019, a team of stewardship, science, and conservation staff from across the U.S. prepared a guidance document for the eastern U.S. under the sponsorship of Mark Anderson, which provides guidance for the Nature Conservancy's land management practitioners on how to incorporate principles for managing terrestrial systems for ecosystem resilience into stewardship and restoration activities. These managing for resilience uh, the Managing for Resilience document addresses managing for soil, freshwater, fire, connectivity, composition and structure, both species and systems, and invasive plants, animals, pests, and pathogens. And more recently, we published a document on the correlation uh, between insect and disease with reduced carbon sequestration in forests of the contiguous United States. Currently, one of our major efforts is to develop a formal communication strategy based on feedback from a broad list of TNC representatives, which will include an evaluation of subject matter, frequency, and informational needs. Part of our communication strategy is to provide informational webinars, such as the one we're all on today. With that, I'd like to introduce Lindsay Chatterton. Lindsay is our Aquatic Invasive Species Program Director with our Great Lakes Program. Lindsay, if you want to share your screen, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Rob.
Okay, I'm, I'm assuming you can see this all right? Yes, we can. Okay, so thanks, Rob. Um, yep, so today, uh, really, we sort of want to use this as an opportunity to really talk about the potential for uh, environmental DNA as a method, uh, both in terms of invasive species management, but also thinking about how we might advance some of our, some of our biodiversity inventory and, and sort of restoration work and, and how this tool really can be applied both in aquatic, uh, terrestrial and marine systems. Um, so the, the talk will start off uh, really focusing on a primer about the method. Um, we'll talk about some current applications uh, and, and identify some of the limitations and pitfalls to the method that, that folks should be aware of. And then really bring it home, really highlighting some of the sort of recent innovations and, and advances in the tool that really just shows the broad potential across across a range of habitats. Um, if we have time at the end, it'd be nice to try and identify some future information needs for future seminars or maybe even a session at the next global science meeting uh, when that happens. And then from a personal perspective, noting that I uh, have a slight accent, um, my personal goal is to try and talk slowly and clearly uh, so that Nick doesn't make me look too bad when, when he comes on and Lee doesn't have too much uh, uh, translation to do later. So if we think about monitoring, um, uh, you know, there are a number of problems that we face uh, in, in the natural environment. You know, from a, um, from a rare species point of view, elusive species, things that have, have, have sort of behavioral or life history traits that mean they're hard to find, or in difficult environments where it may be costly uh, or difficult or dangerous to, to sample. Um, we can often have low detection probabilities, uh, particularly when we're using traditional gears or traditional approaches. And then on the other end of, of, of the scale, we, we have these areas where we have high community diversity, where, where we've got hundreds or if not thousands of potential species that could be present in a site. And particularly for invertebrates um, uh, and, and a range of other species that really are um, uh, in, in incredibly abundant, traditional tools in terms of sampling and then picking through and identifying species can be incredibly uh, slow and, and time, time costly in terms of uh, processing. And then of course, there are obvious limitations from uh, an identification perspective. So if, if, so for me, uh, I was reflecting on this last night, I think throughout my career, this issue of detection probability uh, and, and, and how to do things smarter, it has sort of been an ongoing theme. Uh, so many, many years ago when I wasn't so follically challenged, uh, I was heavily involved in an island rat eradication program uh, in New Zealand where we were trying to remove uh, Norway rats from a 660-acre island um, using a ground-based operation on an island where it had a long history of uh, use of anticoagulant poisons. And we ended up in a situation where we had both bait-shy or resistant rats. And we had to find those. And so what we were doing on a daily basis was checking uh, slabs of butter uh, because that proved to be the best method to, to find the 20 or 30 rats that are remaining on this island. Um, and it was just incredibly time consuming uh, way to approach things. And then about 10 years later, I was overseeing or uh, um, helping manage a, uh, a survey for invasive fish across New Zealand. And we were relying upon a bunch of traditional tools, nets, minnow traps, and those sorts of things. And, and while we detected a number of new locations, we did not have a lot of confidence, particularly uh, around uh, common carp, about our ability to detect them. We had at least two sites where we visually saw these fish, but we were not able to capture them. Th these were just examples where, um, in both instances, we have a potentially high false negative rate, i.e. we were failing to detect things when we knew they were present. Um, in both instances, we had unsustainable non-target impacts, and that's often the case when we use some of these traditional tools. And it was an inefficient and labor intensive process. So when we think about these species monitoring challenges, when we're facing with um, you know, these sort of rare and elusive species, there are sort of two alternatives to improve our detection sensitivity. We can either increase the air effort or we can change to a more sensitive method of detection. So if we think about the needle in the haystack problem, uh, when we're looking for that, we can either bring in lots and lots of people and, and systematically work our way through the haystack or we could use something like a metal detector. And depending on the size of that metal detector, we could do this really efficiently and really quickly. It's interesting, uh, around the mid-2006, uh, Hayes published a paper 
looking at uh, marine pest surveillance in, in Australia. And, and he, he made two, two key points that really were instrumental in, in some of our thinking around these problems. The first being that you should target the most abundant life history stages. So for marine invertebrates, it's those early larval stages where they're producing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of larvae into the water. So why target the, the, the settled or, or the benthic organism where you can start to, to target some of these you know, planktonic and hugely abundant members, um, individuals. And then secondly, from a genetic, um, well, from an ID perspective, rather than picking through the samples, what they, what they identified was that genetic methods were far more efficient and effective at, at ident identifying the species. So for me, uh, the sort of beginning of the journey really related to two or three things that were going on in my career at the time. I was involved in uh, uh, permitting uh, a collection of marine mammal tissue. Uh, and there was real debate in the New Zealand community at the time between proponents are using darts. So these are basically crossbow darts that fired into the, into the animal to get a tissue plug. And, and the other part of the community was simply saying, look, we don't need to do that. We can actually collect skin and feces that are slothed off or shared into the environment and do the population genetics from that material. Uh, I was involved with the Australasian Invasive, um, uh, invasive um, Research Centre, and, and uh, I was aware they were also uh, trying to manage an incursion of, of fox into Tasmania. The, the, those that don't know Australia, the, the small island to the bottom left, uh, bottom right. Um, so fox were thought to have invaded on the island, and, and what the Australians were doing, uh, where they were using dogs to find fox poo, um, or feces, and, and essentially then running the genetics on that to determine whether it was a fox or a dog. Uh, and then, of course, for me, I, I've obviously watched way too much television, and I thought if we can identify a humans, specifically an individual's DNA off a, off a glass or a cigarette butt, why couldn't we start to do that in the environment? And then in 2008, Fisitola published a key paper for, for those in the aquatic environment, where he demonstrated that he could detect bullfrog DNA in wetlands taking small 15 milliliters samples of water uh, and essentially extracting the DNA from that. And that really kicked off our thinking with regards to how do we take this tool and, and how do we start to apply it across aquatic systems at the time. I was lucky enough to then really partner with, with three key individuals at the University of Notre Dame. So Chris Judy at the top, Annie Mayhart in the middle and David Lodge at the bottom, where we were grappling with an issue of, of the spread of Asian carp through the Chicago Canal system. And, and rather than uh, and in talking to the Army Corps Engineers Colonel who was managing the project, he was grappling with the issue where the folks that were using traditional tools uh, like electric fishing or nets were arguing for a double or tripling of their budget without them being able to tell them what difference that would make in terms of their detection sensitivity. So we were funded to essentially develop this method uh, with regards to looking for big and silver carp within the canal. So that paper was published in 2011, and essentially what it showed uh, was that, uh, and this is the, the picture here on the left, oops, sorry, the, um, uh, what, what we found was that the eDNA method was effective at detecting uh, big and silver carp within the canal system, and it was far more effective than these traditional methods. So the, the graph on the bottom here, uh, the, the, the bars, uh, uh, the detection within the four pools leading up to the electric barrier within the canal, uh, and, and really, they were only detecting carp in, in the Marcel and Dresden Island pools uh, uh, using electric fishing and nets. Whereas we were able to show with um, parameter DNA, and this was collecting two liter samples and filtering them through glass microfiber filters, that we could detect uh, carp right up and up to the barrier. And that meant the carp were, were, were threatening to invade the Great Lakes. And, and really, that was sort of a pivotal study that really got things moving. Over subsequent years, we've, we've, we've been able to take these methods and apply them across the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a study uh, led by my colleague, Andrew Tucker, again, partnering with the folks at the University of Notre Dame, where we looked at the spread of Eurasian rough throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, and, and again, we're able to detect uh, these species uh, outside what the known range was, and, and that information was, was able to be used to, to think about future surveillance needs and, and surveys within the lakes. And really, the method has been picked up so that now the Fish and Wildlife Service have a basin-wide invasive carp eDNA surveillance program, where they're taking something in the order of 2,000 samples across the Great Lakes, uh, looking for big even silver carp. And it really is uh, a cornerstone of the surveillance program 
particularly for these species within the Great Lakes, uh, and, and really is, 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 is a key part of their management program. So what is environmental DNA? Well, essentially it's genetic material that's been shed into the environment from living organisms. And that can be through excretion, so feces and urine, secretions like mucus, uh, or exfoliated um, cells, so epidermal cells, scales, and that sort of thing. Um, shedding rates are gonna vary by species, the life stage, the size of the individuals, their behavior, are they stressed, are they spawning, are they doing things that is likely to increase uh, the amount of um, material that, that's being shed, uh, or, and also environmental factors like pH and temperature that will both influence behavior, but also influence uh, how long the, the material hang around. So DNA could be larger pieces of tissue made up of many cells or single cells, or, found in, or it could be the DNA found in organelles, so parts, parts of cells like the mitochondria. So just in the top corner, the, the, the hand is, is holding some, some, some whale skin, uh, but there are various examples of how DNA could end up in the environment. Barnes et al. essentially has shown that if you, if you run the DNA through a, a different series of pores, you know, it covers a broad range of high classes from you know, 0.2 microns, which is likely to be free, free DNA that's in the system, right up to 20 microns uh, and, and probably higher, which means we're probably starting to get into that cellular material that, that's floating in the environment. And the key is, can we collect that and then, and then do something with it? So another key consideration that we need to think about is the sort of the dynamics of eDNA in the environment and, and also the target species. These are ultimately going to be essential to understanding where to sample and how to interpret results. And a key paper to look at is, is the paper by Darling uh, et al. in 2022, where they talk about false positives, but they really talk about how you need to think about a detection and put it within the context of the species. So within water, we know when the DNA is shed, some of it's going to float and pass through the system quickly. Some of it's heavier, it's going to sink. Um, so, uh, and, 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 but again, likely to move through the system. Um, so within the aquatic environment, we know that, you know, DNA can be transported horizontally by currents uh, or in a terrestrial environment by wind, vertically, um, and we think particularly here about settling from gravitation, gravitational settling. Um, it can be trapped in stratified water layers, probably potentially within stratified air as well, um, but also it can become stuck to things. It's sticky, particularly in an aquatic environment, so it can be stuck to sediment or, or plant matter, and that has implications particularly when we're thinking about you know, stream systems that potentially are, are running with really high sediment loads. Um, and then the other key point is it can inadvertently be, tra inadvertently be trans transferred by humans and wildlife. So when we think about eDNA, both in terms of where to sample and then what a detection might mean, we need to stop thinking about purely about what, what's going on with the organism, but start to think about what, where that DNA is ending up in the, in the environment. And we need to think about it as, as a plume. So I use this example of a car driving along a, a gravel road. Really, this is, this is a fish or, or another organism traveling along and it's leaving behind um, its, its DNA plume. Uh, and, and ultimately that's what we're trying to sample uh, to, to detect these species. So other key thing that we need to think about is eDNA degradation. And, and uh, that has implications both in terms of how you sample, how quickly you need to get that sample preserved, but also, uh, it influences both transport and result, interp result interpretation. So degradation is going to be affected by both abiotic and biotic conditions. So you know, bacterial activity, UV light, temperature, pH, salinity are all likely to affect uh, degradation rate. So DNA may degrade really quickly and disappear rapidly from the system. And, and the, the graphs on the right, right are some work that, that met Barnes led uh, they really looked at the degradation rate of common carp in, in both, uh, essentially in, in the lab water and in, in natural water. And what he showed was that really um, we saw rapid degradation over about a 24 hour period where most of that DNA disappeared from the system. And then if we looked at environmental index, areas where we had low autotrophic and heterotrophic activity and neutral pH, the DNA was likely to last longer than when we ended up with areas with high pH. Um, and lots more sort of bacterial or fungal activity that was likely to break these cells and the DNA down. But on the converse, the, the DNA may degrade slowly or even persist. And examples of that are like anaerobic soil. And if you look, look at the sort of, um, uh, sort of historic DNA work, people are extracting DNA from sediment cores and those sorts of things. Um, so 
if the DNA is being preserved and persists, um, that has real implications with regards to potential transport distances. But if it's retained in the system for prolonged periods, it can also be resuspended and then come back in the system. So again, there could be an echo or, or a signal from an historic presence that we need to be aware of. So just uh, again, think about degradation, think about transport when, when, you, when you start to pick up positives and, and how that might, might relate to your system. Um, when we think about how to collect the DNA, um, there are a range of, of, of approaches. And, and you know, in an aquatic system, you can filter the water, you can centrifuge the water and extract the DNA from that, or you can precipitate the DNA out. Now, in terms of, of uh, method, as you move from filtration to centrifuge to precipitation, you have decreasing the amount of water that, or decreasing amount of, of, of volume of sample that you can, that you can uh, essentially process. Uh, so like typically precipitation would be like a 15 mil sample, uh, whereas uh, filtration could be anywhere up to you know, tens or hundreds of liters. But in terms of the uh, DNA, increasing DNA recovery, precipitation is sort of the gold standard. You're getting most, if not all, of the DNA out. So if, if we sort of look at um, the percentage of the total carb DNA uh, that, that, that's present, ultimately precipitation will pull all of the DNA out. Now, if we, if we look at the sort of the, the relative size proportions um, that we find particularly in the water, um, so this is a study again by, by Turner and Barnes, et cetera, that, that, that essentially did a serial um, filtration starting with the, the largest pore size and moving down to precipitation at the other end uh, to essentially look at what was the size classes of, of, of DNA present in the system. Uh, and and, and what, what it showed is, is that, you know, we, we are picking up uh, anything from, you know, sort of probably DNA free in the environment through to, to chunks of DNA up to 10 or 20 microns uh, in, in diameter or probably larger than that. And, and if we tie that back into, um, if we think about the sort of size of various structures in the body, that sort of 10 to, to 20 micron area is, is, is typical you know, animal cell size. So, so many fish, the average diameter of cell sizes is, you know, fifth, you know in that sort of 15 micron range. So certainly for a, from a nominal pore size, if there's loose cells flowing through the system, um, uh, certainly we should better pick them up with a larger pore size. So the key thing to note is that there is a trade-off here between your filter size and the amount of volume that, that you can ultimately filter. So when you move to a really fine filter size and that sort of 0.2 to 0.4 micron, you're going to obviously extract more of the DNA, but you're likely to only be able to uh, filter a much smaller volume. Whereas if you go to much larger nominal pore sizes, you're going to be able to filter much larger volumes. And essentially this graph here by Turner et uh, al essentially shows that you can get a comparable level of detection or, or essentially collect the same amount of um, DNA as you move up to these larger pore sizes, and simply because you can ultimately filter much larger volumes of water. Some other sampling considerations that you need to think about is, is that you, know, you need to think about what your target organism is uh, and where it is, and that's gonna influence where and how you sample. You need to consider how it is using its site, but also likely eDNA transport routes. But you also need to think about whether you can target, whether you are primarily trying to target eDNA or whether you can target the whole organism or both. And I'm particularly thinking here about, um, you know, larval life stages that are hugely abundant, that are, again, going to be in that nominal pore size or, or that size range uh, that, that really is, is up to that 20, 60, 100 micron uh, net or, or filter could easily pick all these species up. So, so particularly when we think about zebra mussel um, uh, eDNA surveys, it's like they're picking up both villages and free eDNA, but the same would apply if we think about marine or, or lake or even riverine um, plankton sampling. We can go to a smaller pore size where we're gonna collect all of the DNA in that sample, or we can go to a much larger pore size or filter size where we potentially can, can, can filter much larger volumes and both pick up cellular, material as well as the whole organism. Uh, and, and these are sort of considerations that you need to think about with regards to what is ultimately going to be the best way for you to sample some of these systems, particularly when we think about large open oceans or large lakes, 
Um, so the, the picture at the bottom here on the left is, is the sort of standard fish and wildlife service approach where they're collecting five 50 mil uh, tube samples um, that they then spin down to extract the DNA. And then on the right is some work that we're doing to, to essentially determine whether or not we can use plankton nets, uh, you know, with a with a, uh, a mesh size in the 20, 50, or 60 uh, micron range to essentially get a similar or hopefully better level of detection because we're able to sample much larger volumes of water. So the other thing we need to think about is both sample replication and spatial coverage. We know the DNA is likely to be patchy, it's going to be transported from species that are going to move. So um, they may move or they may not move. So we've got highly mobile species that might be moving through a site, or we have highly sedentary species that are likely to be highly localized. Hence, unless we have current, there may also be a localized plume of DNA. Um, a species may be present, um, may be transient in the, in, in the system. Um, so all of these things uh, essentially say we need to be thinking about both how, how much effort we put into a site and, and, and over what sort of spatial scale should we be surveying. Key thing to note is replication can solve for the trade-off between DNA recovery and water volume. So if you're really set on recovering all of the DNA or most of the DNA from your sample and are therefore going for these smaller pore sizes, what you've probably got to do is increase the number of replicates that you're taking across the site. So the map on the right is some work that we were doing looking for big head carp across the Great Lakes. You know, two to 3,000 samples taken across the system. Um, again, rare and elusive species. I think we had outside of the Chicago Canal, we had four to six um, detections of big head and silver carp across the system. So this sort of gives you an idea of sort of the spatial scale, scale required to, to sort of identify and pick up some of these early invaders. Um, and, and, and to me, uh, eDNA, it's, it's, it's not just about genetics, it's very much about spatial ecology and thinking about, and, 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 uh, and biology, thinking about what the organism is doing and thinking about sample size and sampling design across the landscape in order to maximize your ability to detect the species. So there are two sort of key approaches to, to screening, um, uh, to, to screening the, um, oops, sorry, to, to to, to screening uh, your sample for the DNA. The, the standard method that was used uh, historically has, has been to amplify the DNA through either a PCR, qPCR, or a digital drop of PCR. Uh, and actually, I think I saw a, a triple PCR something today uh, on one of the papers. These tools are essentially using targeted, um, are using the, these tools are being used to target specific species. So using markers that are looking to amplify the DNA of your target species, we're looking at presence absent. You can clearly screen a sample for a number of species, but the sample is finite. And so as you, you, know, you can only take maybe three to six subsamples in order to screen it before you're going to exhaust, exhaust your sample. And then if we think about in the sort of detection sensitivity, PCR, really not many people are using that anymore. Um, you know, qPCR and, and, and digital drop of PCR are really um, uh, are, are the more sensitive techniques and uh, have been shown to be far more efficient uh, and, and effective than say PCR from, a, from an approach in the field. The other thing that, that really is cropping up is, is increasingly people are turning uh, to using meta barcoding or, or high throughput sequencing. Uh, and this allows you to evaluate the whole community um, and, and, and look at the presence and identity of many species. Uh, and, and really this is to me the most exciting uh, part of, of sort of the eDNA journey at the moment with regards to our ability to take a sample and really look at whole communities uh, and, and see what is present. So, oh, sorry. So when we think about meta barcoding, we sometimes hear the words next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing. Uh, essentially, they're talking about the same thing. And it's this idea of using a marker or multiple markers to essentially uh, amplify all of the DNA in the, in, the, in the sample and then really sequencing. Uh, sequencing that sample and then and blasting against the existing gene libraries to see what is present. So if we think about the workflow, it's the same sort of thing. You're collecting a sample, you're extracting the DNA, you're then prepping that and sequencing uh, using these general markers. And then ultimately there's a bioinformatics process whereby you're essentially looking at the sequence barcodes uh, to, to identify um, you know, which species are present. 
Uh, the, the wheel on the right is, is a product produced by the Wilder Lab in New Zealand that just sort of shows you the sort of diversity of species that they are detecting from a, from a site. Uh, you know, range of things, you know, from worms and mollusks through to mammals, birds, fish, um, and going down to plants, the algae and bacteria as well. So the, the beauty of the meta barcoding is that ability to really look at these whole communities, depending on which markers you're using. Just to give you an example of, of, of how we've applied it within the Great Lakes, this, this is some work that we've been doing with the uh, EPA in, in Duluth, the St. Louis history uh, in Western Lake Superior. This is an area of diverse habitat where the EPA has a comprehensive data set on the fish community present. They've been sampling in here since 2006. Um, so, you know, there's over 10 years of data on, on the fish community within the, within the system. We undertook a, a, a survey using eDNA uh, both spring and fall sampling, we took 120 samples across this estuary, which is about 15 kilometres wide and, and 15 to 20 kilometres deep. Uh, and this is some work that, that Chelsea Hatzenberler, uh, Joel Hoffman uh, et al. from the US EPA have, have, have been doing it in, in collaboration with myself and Andrew Tucker and others. So what do we find um, from just that one set of sampling? We, we picked up a combined total of 57 species. Um, uh, 51 in June, 11 of which were unique to June, and 46 um, uh, in, in the October sample, six of which were unique to October. So again, again, it shows the sort of ability to think about the species and seasonal use of, of the estuary and how that community is changing through time. Um, key, key thing to note is that we, did, we failed to detect three species that have historically been, been picked up within the system, but we got 14 species that physical surveys had, had not um, detected within the system. Uh, and um, uh, although five, so we got 14 species that physical surveys in that year had failed to detect, but five of those had previously been detected from the system. And if you look at the species uh, accumulation curves, the black line at the bottom here is, is, is what was um, achieved through sampling using traditional tools. And then the red and, and green is, is what we achieved with the eDNA surveys. And, and what, what this data is essentially showing is, is the, really the power of, of the next generation sequencing uh, metabarcoding approach in terms of detecting uh, a, a wider range and, 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 and a, a greater number of species within, within the system. The other thing to note is, is that from an occupancy point of view, eDNA certainly suggests, um, was certainly was showing much higher levels of occupancy across the system or many species compared to what traditional tools were showing. So some quick challenges um, in terms of uh, some things to think about when we think about eDNA. So there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding the term false positive. And, and this has presented a really a, a significant hurdle to the adoption. A lot of this was driven out of uh, the Asian carp debate within the Chicago Canal, where really people were talking about DNA getting there through uh, some alternative route as opposed to being uh, due to the presence of a live fish. We need, to dis we need to distinguish between a false positive sample, i.e. the detection of the target DNA when that DNA is not present, versus a false positive site when we may well have detected the DNA, but that doesn't, doesn't actually show, well, we, we've detected the DNA, but the, the target is not actually present at that site. So if we think about a false positive sample, um, uh, really that's gonna result from contamination, non-specific ampl amplification, or errors in the genomic reference database. Um, most of these things can be solved through sort of best management QA, QC. Um, there's some great resources out there uh, that are listed here, um, but really the Darling paper, Darling et al, uh, and environmental DNA really outlines and describes the issue with regards to what we mean by a false positive but has many of these references with regards to where you can go to uh, and, 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 and look at best practice with regards to both field sampling and laboratory practices. The other side of things is the false positive side. And this is when, as I said, the DNA is detected, but the target is not present at the site. And this could be due to DNA being transported to, through, to the site through environmental factors or transferred there by humans or wildlife. So in the, in, in the example on the right, you know, fish, a fish market releasing its, uh, it's wastewater into the system and, and you're picking up the DNA from there. The key point here is it requires a balanced discussion of what those alternative sources are and really how realistic they are. And, 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 and the key thing is, is to 
get out early, have that communication and, and agree on where we're going. So some other challenges are really sort of the, the particularly from a metagenetics point of view, are, are gaps in the sequence library. Uh, and this is a paper by Marquise et al that really looked at both threatened species and, and broader species richness. And the bright red uh, essentially is, is, is showing um, uh, greater than sort of 50% you know, of, of, of the species present in the site have been sequenced. Um, so areas where we have light colors or lighter yellows essentially is showing you know, quite significant gaps and it's quite significant gaps uh, in, in, in the existing gene library. And so going into this, now this is an aquatic example. So it just means that when you're going into this, you need to think about what are your targets? Does that, do those sequences exist in the system? Or is, is there a close congener? Or can we collect specimens to start to build out that, that gene library? And certainly there's a lot of efforts that are going on at the moment to improve the genetic library so that we can solve some of these problems. And there's a, there's a pretty cool uh, shiny app uh, really that builds out of Marquise's paper that allows you to go in uh, and, and from a marine or a freshwater perspective and, and, and choose your taxa, look at your markers and just look at what sort of percentage of, of the community uh, is covered by these markers. And, and there's some cool species lists and it really allows you to, to look at you know, what, what, what are the potential pitfalls that are applying this technique to the system that you're interested in? And there are some plenty, there's plenty of really good cool toolkits out there that both allow you to think about how to do the science and what the limitations are, are with regards to management, but also some nice decision, decision trees that allow you to, to think about how you should interpret results once you pick those up. So really, this is where we wanted to get into the more interesting stuff, some of the novel applications. A lot of what I've talked about, my background has been related to aquatic systems, but there's some really cool stuff happening, particularly within the terrestrial systems as, as to where we go. This is a study uh, by Johnson et al. Uh, in Texas, where they looked at dust traps and, and extracting the DNA from air blown dust. Um, uh, and they essentially demonstrated it was a viable method to detect wind pollinated and other terrestrial plants. Um, in, in these rangeland environments. Um, it certainly, again, just, just shows, think about that plume, think about where that DNA is going. Um, in New Zealand and, 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 in the, and here in the US, there's, there's another study being led by Neil Gemmel uh, out of Otago in, in the Wilder Lab, which is really looking about, looking at the, whether or not we can detect terrestrial species in, in, in stream, stream systems in a way that allows us to reliably identify uh, terrestrial vertebrate diversity within an area uh, and, and essentially look at uh, the success of, of our invasive species suppression uh, and or eradication efforts. And so, you know, the sort of classic uh, freshwater text is the valley rules the stream, but this study is starting to suggest that the stream might also hold the valley secrets uh, in, in, in the DNA that's being transported through the system. Nick, I think you're up, mate. Thanks, Lens. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, Lens has provided an excellent background. Um, and so I'm just going to show a few quick slides on uh, a project that actually builds on um, uh, the, the University of Otago and Gamel Lab. Uh, so with the, the streams holding, holding the secrets there. And so uh, as you probably gathered, there's a huge amount of science that has been moved in the aquatic space. And you can see that a lot of the foundational knowledge is being to developed in order to understand how these tools, how eDNA can be used for different types of monitoring needs. What we don't have in the terrestrial space is the equivalent foundational science. And so part of what um, we are working on is attempting to build that foundational science that will allow us to understand the applicability of these eDNA tools into the terrestrial space, much the same way that it has been achieved in the aquatic space. And so uh, these are just some of the types of papers that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, were beginning to be around in the aquatic space, essentially sort of pointing out that, hey, we can detect things in the terrestrial environment using eDNA as a tool. And so there, there's a lot of activity in this space as well. So Lindsay, if you could flick a slide forward for us, please.
Um, so uh, the group that we are working with, so we, uh, we're in a, it's called a hui. It's sort of a Polynesian word. It's just a gathering of, of people towards a common goal. This is a selection of groups that are, are, are all connected with sort of common purposes around this terrestrial question. And a, a key group that I'll point out there is the University of, Ta of Otago. Um, and Neil Gemmell and his lab were able to obtain a, a, a very a substantial grant from the New Zealand government um, in order to pursue these questions. And the primary reason for this is because New Zealand has set this goal of predator-free New Zealand 2050. They're going to remove rodents, stoats and possums from New Zealand. Massive landscape scale goal. This is conservation's moonshot for, uh, uh, for our century. How are they going to monitor effectiveness? This is what's driving um, part of the question. And eDNA is being explored as one of those additional tools not the only tool, but an additional tool that can help uh, New Zealand understand if they are achieving this, this goal. Um, we have a project here um, in the US, so Island Conservation, oh, the Nature Conservancy and USDA. Um, I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper into um, uh, what some of the experiments that we're doing that contribute to this space. I would point out that some of this work um, also extends into French Polynesia. Um, and uh, you see the Wilder Lab there, which is a New Zealand-based group that's doing a lot, of the, a lot of the activity. And the USDA labs here in uh, Colorado are actually doing a lot of the work too. So next slide, please, Linz. So this is sort of the, the, the raison d'etre. So we're talking about invasives monitoring. And in a terrestrial environment, islands uh, have a disproportionately higher rate of uh, endangerment and extinction. There's only 5% of the world's landmass on islands, yet we know they hold 20% of, of biodiversity, have had most of extinctions. And when we look closely, we can see that invasives have been implicated. So we, the conservation raison d'etre for islands is really clear. Keep invasives off islands and where possible, get rid of them if you can. And so this is where eDNA is, is being brought into this business case. Uh, next slide, please. So the two, the two places that this HUI is looking at the application of eDNA is at the, the front end. So here at TNC in California, we've got a real interest in learning about the applicability of these tools for island biosecurity. So on the front end. So uh, Santa Cruz Island Preserve is an island in the Channel Islands. Um, eight major channel islands and we work closely with the US Navy and the National Park Service that also manage these other islands. We have a list of 20 invasive species ranging from West Nile virus to Argentine ants to rodents that we do not want to see come onto the island and we need to understand what detection tools are in the market space in order to uh, 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 detect them and then rapidly respond. So that's one application here that we're interested in. The second application um, is at the back end, is where there are eradication efforts like predator-free New Zealand, what is our capacity to understand uh, if we are being effective? And typically with these kinds of eradication projects, uh, so let's do the next slide. So th this is a map of where eradication projects have been done around the world. It's, it's primarily a smaller island application. It's been more than 1,500 efforts to do this kind of thing. About half of them are rodents, and there's a success rate of about 85%. Typically, with these kinds of projects, you expend about 50% of your resources in removing 95 to 99% of the animals, and you spend the, the remaining 50% on trying to get rid of that last 1%. Animals respond very differently when they're in a low density environment, and particularly when you've just transitioned them into that low density kind of environment. And so this is where these tools become incredibly important and there's massive opportunity to increase the cost effects, efficacy, efficacy of these uh, conservation strategies, but also to uh, get to understand if it's working. So next slide. So what are we doing at USDA? Um, we have what are called mesocosms. So they, for the Fort Collins Laboratory has these fantastic sort of uh, experimental houses that we can create artificial islands. 
and the model animal that we're working with right now are mice. Um, and what we're doing is we have a number of fake islands effectively, and we mimic uh, uh, daylight, temperature, rainfall, a host of other things like this. And we are focusing on, although we're looking in, we, these are terrestrial environments, in inverted commas, the places that we are looking for the eDNA is where water will be captured. So much like the stream holds the secrets, in this case, we believe that uh, rather than random sampling in the soil, it's probably going to be focused sampling in environments like around vegetation. So we have places, um, you can see some of the experimental design here where we introduce mice and then we remove mice. And you can see that sort of the types of questions like, well, how long does terrestrial eDNA last in an environment? And then we're also having sort of, we're preventing mice from going into certain areas. And so there's adjacent areas where mice DNA may be airborne or may be um, distributed because of our artificial rainfall. And then we sample in those areas as well. Um, and so far it's looking really positive. We can, no pun intended, we, there are really good signals that are turning up that we can detect mice, uh, particularly after our artificial rainfall in a variety of different habitats, which tells us that yes, if we get a single invader um, or we have a remnant population that we need yet to eradicate, we may be able to detect them. Uh, all right, next slide. I think that's it. All right, that's all you, Lee. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, transitioning with that, a, a great um, sort of terrestrial conundrum of how to pick out mice, literally the, the DNA fragments that are potentially in the air or the soil. Um, likewise, forest pests present a really interesting challenge for eDNA because the environment of the eDNA um, availability is within a tree or on a tree. That's tricky. So um, I thought I would give a couple case studies to show everybody where the science is going to tap into this technology in this incredibly um, challenging form of the environment of a forested system. Um, two great examples of how this is moving forward is um, saline-filled fi saline biosurveillance traps. So traditionally, a lot of insect traps have um, like an alcohol-based preservative and you would, uh, you know, um, gather it up every once in a while and then take into the lab a big pile of alcohol soaked, discolored, sticky, dead bugs. And then you'd have to hand um, key out each species to determine whether or not the invasive species that you're looking for is present in that trap. Well, with um, metabarcoding, which Lindsay talked extensively about in the aquatic environment, you've essentially created a trap that presents itself more or less like the stream itself. The insects fall in, and then you can metabarcode that saline solution for multiple invasive insects. This has been um, recently published in uh, Canada for both the uh, moth Lymantria dispar, now known as spongy moth, as well as uh, emerald ash borer in these sort of um, hanging pitfall traps of types for insects. Then also for um, trees are filled with sap, which is a fluid <laughs> to state the obvious. So you can um, actually take sap samples and test for insects that are interacting heavily with either their feces or their frass or their bodies with the sap phloem layer in the tree. And this is um, a current PhD project by a woman named Kathleen Kyle. I saw her give a presentation, I believe last year with Rutgers University. Um, she is taking sap samples from all four uh, cardinal directions on emerald ash borer, potentially infested ash trees to help um, super early detection of emerald ash borer in previously to help research whether or not it's possible to do super early detection of emerald ash borer at exceptionally low densities of infestation, which is a big problem with the emerald ash borer infestation that it's so hard to, det to detect at very low density. This is kind of like the opposite of what Nick was describing is when it's at exceptionally low density in a terrestrial environment, you have to get really creative to figure out the data you're looking for. Next slide, Lindsay. It didn't flip. 
Um, Sorry, Lee. It's still there. It's, uh, I'll try this. Oops. Okay, awesome. Um, we're running low on time, so I'm going to skip the video, but just in case, later, everybody, I put it in the chat, open it up later and watch it. So spotted lanternfly is a subject of major eDNA um, potential because even though we all think of it, if you're familiar with it, as this really flashy adult with these red um, panels on its wings, that underwing is only evident when it's stressed or dead. Um, it's actually fairly cryptic in its natural environment, which can be dense shrubberies and trees. But you can um, take advantage of the honeydew production of spotted lanternfly. Um, which is disgusting. And what it is, is that it passes a, a grotesque amount of um, sticky excrement and it covers everything around it. Um, and that sticky excrement is um, uh, persistent on uh, vines and the ground and trunks of the infested trees, even after the bugs have departed themselves. And so you can either use a technique called spray aggregation, which is more or less hosing down a plant, or paint rollers, where you dip a literal paint roller in. Um, clean water, distilled water, and then you roll the, the, the tree or the vine with a paint roller and then you sample the water on the paint roller. So you're, pro you're essentially producing an aquatic environment to uptake that sticky DNA filled excrement, which is in the video for anybody who wants a good laugh. Um, and uh, when you use that technique instead of visual survey for this relatively cryptic insect, um, you can see here, this recent paper shows that 84% of infestations were found instead of 36. Um, that's a huge improvement. And so eDNA creates a, a much more effective detection-based system with spray aggregation or paint rollers with essentially finding that um, excreted material instead of actually looking for the bugs themselves. I think the next slide is Lindsay's again. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Lee. So, so really looking at thinking about this from the opposite point of view, um, what else? Uh, you know, we, we talk about worker bees. If you're thinking about trying to uh, survey the, <coughs> excuse me, the plant community uh, across a, a broad area, bees are going out and they're coming back with pollen, they're coming back with with DNA material back to the hive, and and there are a number of papers that are starting to come out that. That are essentially sequencing the honey DNA uh, to describe the, the plant and, and, and other community uh, around the area, as well as uh, being able to use it to detect and monitor for honeybee pathogens and parasites. So, you know, again, it's that, that same principle, you know, we talked about earlier the, the idea of wildlife transporting the DNA. Well, that actually could be to our advantage, particularly if we're thinking about sensitive habitats where we might want to wander through it and, and damage it. Let the bees do the work for you and, and potentially they can, uh, you know, there's a potential here for them to, to essentially say, survey and sample the DNA for you. Ooh, is this me? Oh, this is me, me, you. Oh, no, so, okay. And then, and then the other part, the other part of this is, you know, Lee talked a bit about, you know, taking these malaise traps uh, or pitfall traps and, and really using metagenetics to, uh, to, to sample the broad invertebrate community that, that's fallen into the, uh, into, into the saline or, or, or the preservative. And really the, the idea of using metagenetics to process samples is, is really being used across the board. Um, and you can either extract the DNA from the preservative, you can homogenize the samples, really let them ride the blaze and, and extract the DNA from those, or you can add some lysis that, that essentially increases the DNA, DNA that, that is released from the organism, um, particularly important for arthropods, things with hard shells. Um, but it allows you to retain a specimen so you can go back to the presence. Um, and really, as, as Lee said, rapid identification of taxonomically rich samples and improved identification of cryptic samples are just some of the benefits that we get from the sort of metagenetics approach. And numerous examples within the literature that's looking at invertebrates, larval fish, plankton, benthic invertebrates, um, uh, you know, uh, soil invertebrates, the recent paper about sort of log hollow sediments and soils. So the approach is really being used across the board. The other issue that we, we run into is this question of live versus dead. And certainly, uh, you know, a lot of talk about the, the DNA signal within the Chicago Canal. Was it from live fish or was it from fish, that dead fish or, or bird poop or, uh, or fish from a fish market? And we were seeing this sort of signal, DNA signal that wasn't related to live fish. 
eRNA uh, has is a possible solution. So RNA is more prone to degrade than DNA. Um, uh, the patterns of mentioned RNA expression change depending on the physiological condition of the organism. Presence or concentration of mRNA is likely to reflect an organism's presence with much higher resolution than what DNA is. You're not going to face the sort of uncertainty due to transport or persistence that you face with, with DNA with RNA. So it has the potential to provide us with a signal that really confirms this thing is uh, this, this alive organism is present, um, but also has the ability to provide us information beyond that, beyond the sort of presence absence. You know, maybe we can use it to detect spawning or, or other sort of physiological activity. A number of papers are starting to come out on this. It's, a, it's in a field that really is starting to grow. And I think this is more of a watch this space. Uh, it's certainly, I think, going to be the sort of the next frontier that particularly when you're trying to target a specific species uh, where the field might go. Lee? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the field of eRNA is particularly interesting from the um, regulatory perspective because uh, in the work that I do to, to do my best to ensure that additional insects and diseases are not entering the United States through international trade, um, people have been really pushing for either random or targeted sampling of things like solid wood packaging for insects and diseases. And um, while they're visually obvious in the tree on the left, uh, sometimes they're not visually obvious in the slightest in the complicated environment of solid wood packaging. But the fact that eDNA persists even after uh, the verified treatments that would kill the insects, the insects themselves physically would be degrading dead in the wood. And so it could read as a positive find, which is not productive in a regulatory setting because that's not in violation of the international treatment for a dead rotting insect to be in the wood. It's just in violation if it's alive. So the use of eRNA and possible sort of clocks of degradation of eRNA versus eDNA is it, like Lindsay just said, it's a space to watch because it might give us the tools we need to determine how long has it been dead in the grand scheme and whether or not this threat is actually representing adequate treatment and just a byproduct of the prior existence of the organism within international trade or inadequate treatment, and it's either alive or was exceptionally recently alive, thus showing that the um, system is not working properly. So because eRNA is pretty ephemeral, it, it comes and goes, it degrades faster, I think it's going to be a really interesting future space in invasive species um, detection because it will allow to create some sort of a clock. There's a time there's a time that'll be a tighter timing than the degradation that Nick was talking about in the environment for um, mouse eDNA. So really just uh, just to finish up, and, and sorry, we're running late. Um, look, uh, from an eDNA, uh, RNA perspective, uh, it's a field that's evolving rapidly, um, but the tools are good enough in our management really to be applied now, as long as you do things carefully. There are lots of great resources, reviews, and best practice. This graph at the bottom is really just the, the number of reviews. So these are review articles only with regards to eDNA over the last 10 years. Um, so it just gives you an idea of, 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 of the, the interest. It's a growing field. There's lots of good resources out there. There's even a journal dedicated to environmental DNA. So really, I, I think the, the plug here is that I think it's a tool. I think that, that has a lot of potential. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. A okay. lot of potential, and uh, and really, uh, I think watch the space, and and we're here to try and help if if, if folks are interested. Sorry for running late. We and we'd be happy to take questions. Great. People well, time. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Nick. Um, there is, um, you know, a lot of great work going on throughout uh, the country with uh, eDNA. There's a lot of work uh, ongoing here in New York between Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River, and connecting waters that connect inland waters. There's some other work here in New York, uh, as Tamara mentioned, with uh, Hemlock Willi Adelgid. Um, so it, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, it, it, and as Lindsay said, it's, um, it, it's, it's usable. It's, it's ready there uh, to be used. Um, we do have a couple quick questions. Um, first, 
uh, is that uh, the question was asked if eDNA can be used to identify abundance of species in addition to presence. So, so yeah, Nick and, and Lee can jump in, but I'll, 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 I guess I'll start off with, um, yes, it can with a caveat. Um, so particularly when we're talking about quantitative PCR, digital PCR, or from a metagenetics point of view, uh, the number of sequence reads, um, there is, a, I think the literature is essentially suggesting there's a weak, relatively weak, um, but positive relationship between uh, the amount of DNA present uh, as, uh, and, and, and a species abundance. I think taken together with, um, if we think about sampling across the landscape and, and also tie that into the number of samples uh, and the spatial coverage. Uh, so, you know, so the number of samples that are coming back with the species detection, um, I think we can relate, uh, at least come up with some relative measure of abundance, but it's always going to be species and system specific, simply because the eDNA degradation and transport is going to vary from system to system. Um, yeah, and I'll just jump in on that too. I think there's a lot of interest in this kind of concept because of the greater social awareness of wastewater sampling for COVID infection at the community level. Um, and while this is an utterly different topic, advances in the quantifying of that sort of metric will likely eventually trickle into the, um, you know, the ec ecological aspects of eDNA presence and probably lift the field up as a whole. Um, so understanding that that sort of um, metric gathering, you know, and the amount of effort that we are putting into that as a society will likely increase our ability to do it um, for invasive species or uh, rare threatened and endangered native species as well in terms of getting abundance estimates over the span of time. And, and, another... and I, suspect, I suspect the RNA is also going to help us. It's yep. part of that question. Yeah, as well as it is sort of an interesting confluence there with um, the use of eRNA and just RNA research in general right now. Another question that we had is, is are you aware of any work being done to develop, you know, what you might call drift models? You know, to look at a plume of, of DNA, for example, in a system and, and try to determine how long it's been there, how far did it move, where did it move from, things of that nature. So, so in the aquatic environment, there's, there's certainly an active area of research with regards to uh, eDNA transport and movement. Um, actually, CERDIP, so the um, Ministry of Defence is funding a number of projects uh, within the Great Lakes that are really looking at both stream and lake transport of, of eDNA. So, and certainly within the within the cause, um, tying uh, detections with with um, uh, sort of the, the uh, water transport models was certainly something people have been talking about. So yes, there is research going on. Um, uh, yeah, if I, I could point people towards some of the transport stuff that's coming out of the Notre Dame labs. Um, yeah, availability of DNA particles is really important here. Um, I was fascinated by this presentation I saw about the sampling protocol for emerald ash borer um, you know, sh shed DNA within the sap of infested ash trees because they found big differences in positivity according to the cardinal direction of the sap borehole. So the movement of sap even within a single tree is going to essentially create plumes or non-plumes just like in an aquatic environment, the um, layer mixing according to warmth or salinity or whatever might also cause plumes or non-plumes. It's a major issue um, that you know every system has to be researched according to its own um, complexities. Great. Well, I wanted to, uh, again, thank uh, uh, Lindsay, Nick, and Lee for your time today and your expertise on the subject matter. Um, they have their, uh, uh, well, at least their, their contact information was posted. Um, feel free to reach out to any of these individuals or other folks on the Invasive Species Advisory Committee, either on Connect, or you can join our listserv, directions shown here, or you know, reach out to one of our standing members, uh, which include uh, two of our speakers at least, or any of the folks on the, uh, on the call today. So thanks again. 
I hope this has been helpful. Uh, perhaps in the future we can have a follow-up webinar to kind of further this discussion. Um, and with that, unless there's other questions and conversations, I will uh, end today's call. Yeah, I see some hands going up, Lindsay, Lee. Yeah, yeah, Rob, Rob can I, I just want to make a plea. Apologies for, for running late, it was my fault. But um, <clears throat> folks, if, if, if there are specific areas of interest with regards to, to this field, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, we'd like to sort of start to pull together some of those needs and, and, and really set up uh, either more seminars or, or maybe a session at, at one of the next science conferences to sort of try and cover these things. So. Um, we were hoping to have a discussion at the end of this, but please email us and let us know what are you interested in, uh, what are your needs, and we might either be able to point you towards papers, but certainly um, look for some speakers in the future. Yeah, that's great. That's all I was going to say, too. All righty. Lindsay, Lee, Nick, thanks again. And with that, I'll wish everyone a good day, and I'll end the call. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Liam. Thanks.